so when the book was at last published in French, in French, I bought it because you know that's the kind of book I'm buying. You know, the, the book about psychoanalysis. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a reader of big books. You know, I like that. So you know, I was curious about the title. The, English, the French title is different. The, the English title is Reality and Dream, but the, the French title was Psychotherapy of a Plain Indian. And I could see on one side the psychotherapy, you know, which is a, a thing which interests me since my twenties. And the plain Indian, you know, which recalled me, you know, the, the first book I read, which was uh, "Bury My Heart in One Knee." And so to see, you know, this world of a native plunge into the world of the psychoanalytic into a psychoanalytical process, it fascinated me. And then I just opened the book, and I really I realized that the book was not at all theoretical, but it was just the the, the main part of the book was just the, the verbatim, can you say the verbatim, of the, all the sessions from the very first hello to the very last goodbye. <clears throat> it seemed to me that it was a very powerful material for a firm to have all these uh, documents, you know, about what is a psychotherapy, you know, in these days, what, were, what was a psychotherapy in these days, and what, what is it, you know, for an Indian who is so far from this culture to plunge into this world. When it came to cast the film, um, yeah. um, you chose two actors who in so many ways are not alike. They come from different worlds as actors. Oh. And um, did you have that in mind to bring these two people who are so far apart and bring them through the story together? Oh, sure, sure, definitely, definitely. That, that's what the film is about. You know, it's about these two guys who should never meet and they meet. And they become friends, you know. And so that's, you know, and so to try to find two actors who are coming from such a different background, you know, it helped me a lot. And it, I have to say that it's the first time in my life that I'm writing that I'm writing for two actors, you know, because such a film I couldn't write it not knowing. Usually I'm not writing for actors. I'm just writing parts, not thinking about the actors. But you know, each time I was working on this film and discussing it with the producer, he was asking to me, you know, but sure, but who would be Jimmy and who would be Devil? And, uh, and so for the first time in my life, I, was, I think I had the idea, you know, very clearly in my mind, you know, of Benicio and uh, Matthew in, in such a film. And I think it would be wonderful to have these two guys who, who are so different in so many ways and to, to make them meet uh, and, and, and to see what happens in, in their chemistry, you know, the, the two guys so different uh, in, in the same room. Um, also, the picture that the film suggests about America in the early 1950s. This is so much more positive a picture of America than what we usually have in the famous films from this period, the film noirs from this period that you know very well. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered if you had in mind that sense of possible openness and optimism when you constructed the mise it's something which, it's a film that I discovered being French, and there is a film that I didn't know, uh, which is Let There Be Light, the, docu the documentary uh, by John Huston, you know, about the, 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 the psychoanalytical process, you know, in, uh, for the vets just after the war. And it's something which struck me in the film, is how positive all these guys were, how much they believed in progress, and it's a thing which really struck me so, so, so vividly. You know, the, the fact that uh, they felt equal and they felt they, had, they, they, had, they all shared a great optimism for the country. It seems to me that it was the same case in France, but I think it's just after the war, but it seems to me that it was really a crucial thing you know, in the US. The fact that if we, men of goodwill, we stick together, perhaps we can build a better country. And uh, I think that the, the, the film, the, all the book is dealing with this uh, spirit of optimism and I think, I hope that the, the film is dealing with that same spirit. Yeah, I think so. Um, but also, as in many of your films, there are such strong echoes of Hitchcock and of some very dark Hitchcock films. I mean, there's <coughs> Madeline in her perfect vertigo suit yeah. There are the scenes that suggest spellbound, and in particular, there's the score. 
So mm -hmm. how did you work with Howard Shore on this score, and what did you tell him? Uh, and with, with Ho Archo, I don't need so many words to work, you know, because the man is such a genius that, you know, it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite easy to work with such a man. You know, the, I, I know the one thing that we, we, we share when we work together, because I already work with Ho Archo on, on SACAN, is one thing is that for a period film, we don't necessarily need a period music, a period score. You see what I mean? Not to try to imitate uh, the period, the, the period, but to try to create a score just for the film. You know, uh, much more contemporary, contemporary, rather than you know being period, than to, to create a period thing, which I would hate. And after that, you know, so I remember that uh, as soon as I finished the shooting, when I was uh, just in the airport, you know, uh, waiting for the plane, which would bring me back to France. I wrote an email to Howard saying, oh, by the way, I just finished the shooting and in fact, the film could interest you. And, uh, and I, so during the editing process, I used bits and pieces of Howard Shaw, and I guess that for him it should have been excruciating to look at the, the first editing because they, they, there was quotations of all his work, you know, from the, the you know, this um, the film, this other one, you know, this Cronenberg movement that he wrote, you know, this piece that he wrote for, for Scorsese, this sort of thing come on, coming from the game, and so it was like a, you know, a sort of resume of all his life, of all his creative life, you know, in one score. And so, you know, and for him, he had to forget, forget all the, this proposition I was sending to him, and to invent the, 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 the material for this very precise film. It, it's a fabulous score, it's fantastic. It is. It's fabulous. Um, I'm going to open this to the audience for some questions. There's someone who has a mic. Please wait till the mic gets to you um, to speak. So down here. Talk about your own experience with uh, therapy, and maybe did you discuss that with the uh, the actors? Had they done any kind of psychotherapy or therapy of any kind, and what they had uh, learned from it, and what did you learn from it if you had? If you hadn't, are you interested? Uh, so Christopher, you get me with. Uh, so I will just check the translation of your question to be sure that I understood it perfectly. Um, I think I'll, I could rephrase it. Uh, the yeah. question has to do with: Have you had a personal experience of psychotherapy, and have the actors? And if so, how did you integrate that into directing the film? Oh, that's you know. Uh, I know that one thing is that, you know, I knew that before, you know, that Matthew hated, uh, hated, hated, you know, uh, I, I have to use the past, you know, hated the, the, the idea of the psychoanalytical process, you know, because I guess that he experienced, he experienced that when he was too young, so he really hated that, and we had, uh, it was a really defying end considering the psychoanalytical process. I never discussed it properly with the Nisio, but he didn't need to discuss it. Because uh, actually Jimmy doesn't have the choice. You know, he can stay in jail or he can start psychotherapy. You know, so you know, for native time, you know, for Tony Montana, I'm not sure that it's a psychotherapeutic process. You know, for him it's just to talk with a friend. And that's it. And after that, you know, what fascinates me in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, psychotherapy in terms is that for sure when you go and you see a shrink. You hope that he will listen to you, but if he was listening to you, he would be disappointed. He wouldn't earn his money. I mean by that, that he has to listen to what you say, something else than yourself. You know, which is a little yourself inside you, you know, a little voice speaking here and there. So, you know, I, I love the, the beginning. The, the first session between uh, between uh, Jimmy and uh, and, uh, and Devra, and she is uh, is uh, 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 so, uh, is complaining about all these difficulties that he ha that he has struck her, and the shrimp asking him what kind of a wife would you like. Suddenly, he breaks the continuity of his complaining, and he's listening something else. The, 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 the words of this patient. That's what interests me a lot. You know. Sorry about this very abstract uh, answer. After that, you know, speaking about myself, you know, I can't say that I'm really interested into myself, so I wouldn't be a perfect character in a Woody Allen movie. Uh, <laughs> 
that's it, you know, but for sure, I met, you know, I read a lot of books and I met a lot of shrinks, you know, and uh, it happened to be my life, you know, to have to meet and to have, to have some help some people. You know. Back in white, way in the back. Four, four okay. I can't my <laughs> I'm curious about the clip, the use of the clip from John Ford's uh, Young Mr. Lincoln. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the relevance of that particular scene to the rest of the film? I mean, it's a film that was made in 1938. Yeah, and, and this is set in the fifties. I was just curious thematically how it relates. Yeah, the the, the, the film happens in uh, forty eight, I think, and uh, and uh, so I was I was trying to find a, a film with the widower. I love the part of the widowers in films. It's something that I really love. You know, I'm thinking I was thinking about the film with uh, Gary Cooper uh, playing a widower, and I think it's a Denver's movie called Hanging Tree. And uh, so I came in America thinking about this film, but I realized that the film was shot in, 50, in the 50s, in the late 50s, so it was not possible. So we were looking for a film with a widower. And so we had this image of a widower, and behind him, uh, behind the Fonda, you can see this, uh, the, the ice on the water. And so this ice remind me, you know, the young, the, the little girl that Jimmy saw dying, you know, in, in the, on the frozen lake. So it reminds. So there was a political image very strong and connected by two different things to, to Jimmy. Jimmy who thinks about himself like a widower, an eternal widower. This uh, image of the, the snow and the, the, the ice, when, which recalled me, you know, the, the death of this little girl. And after that, I thought that it was really perfect, you know, for me that something insolent in that seeing a native guy looking at the President of the United States, you know, the most famous one, Luke Lincoln, and thinking, it's exactly me. He said, you know, what happened to, to this guy, I know, I understand each one of his words because I, I've been through that, you know, and I've been through that, looking at the President of the United States, looking at Lincoln, I, that it brings some humor in, in, uh, in that scene. Another question? Wave your hand. Uh, my question has to do with the tone of the film. You're, I was completely seduced by the, the sort of landscaping of the film, and particularly the rhythm of the editing, because it, it all avoided the melodrama that this story could have had in it. So could you talk about the relationship, particularly with your editor and cinematographer? Um, this film, this film has a face as you. It has. It, it's always dealing with with a sort of melancholy as you were mentioning it. You know, so we couldn't rush the the, the, the pace too fast. Even though you know, I'm always trying to rush the, the rhythm of, of my own films. You know, I would just have one name to to to, to mention. It's a film maker that I think is the best editor in the world. And so uh, we are the, the editor I'm working with, uh, Laurence Bio and I, who are a great fan of Thelma Mission and Schoolmaker. So we are looking at the Scorsese movie again and again and again and again, and we are trying to learn how to edit properly a film. And after that, we propose you a show, even if in this one, the pace had to be a little bit smoother than uh, something that I, I, I could use on other films. There are many cultures uh, in in the process here. Uh, you're a French director, uh, actors we associate with European movies. Uh, the script is and the conversation is all in English, and there's the uh, Plains Indians and the 1950s or so. Can you talk about your um, involvement and interest in all these different uh, communities and cultures and um, how you consider the placement of the movie. Is it an American movie? Is it English? Is it a movie about Indians? Is it French? 
the, the film is a melting pot as the plot is, a, is about the melting pot. You know, as, uh, as uh, the Topeka institution, you know, the, the Winter Hospital was a melting pot too, you know. So the film had to be, uh, became, you know, quite close to its own plot. You see what I mean? Becoming this mixture of, so I guess that the film has one foot in France and one, film, one foot in America. And uh, I would have to say that the, the film has also one foot in Puerto Rico, you know, with Benicio, and, you know, and I would have to, to add, you know, the one foot in Hungaria because of uh, Dave Rupp. So yes, the film is a melting pot. And you all know, perhaps, that this text that the film is based on is the founding text of the merger of psychoanalysis and anthropology. It also has one foot in each. So yeah, that's sure, that's what I meant, yeah. It's about meeting, different cultures meeting each other. Yes, uh, I'm a great admirer of your films. I have not read Devereaux's book, but I had some trouble trying to connect the director of Kings and Queen with his phenomenally complex portrait and dark portrait of the female protagonist yeah. with the director of this film, where the relationship, different cultures or not, seems to be so amicable from the beginning. So? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, that's what attracted me in the book, you know? That's what attracted me in the film, you know, to try to make a film with, with, which should be quite warmer rather than this uh, terrifying you know, portrait of a woman which was in Kings and Queen. You know, uh, am I the same man? I don't know. You know, each time that you are making a film, you know, you hope that you, I hope that you won't recognize me. No, I hope that I, I will be able to be someone else. And each time I'm disappointed because, you know, when you're screening the film, you know, some people are saying, you know, uh, uh, you just look at it. this film, just look, yeah, like, look like in your other films. And so you're awfully disappointed by that, you know, because you wanted to be so different. And sometimes you show them, and the other spectators are saying, oh, this film is quite like I, I can't recognize you either. And so you're disappointed for another reason. No, but so I don't know. I'm trying to escape myself, and I guess that I always face with myself in another way. Uh, that's how I answer the question. Okay. We only have time for one or two more. Uh, hand up here. If the person with the mic sees someone, there. The locations where um, those therapy sessions are taking place are very interesting, moving. Um, uh, I noticed chairs stacked in the background, suddenly we have a bar in the same place, um, and those drawings at the walls. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the artwork? There's something behind you that looks like it could have been in the film as well. <laughs> this one? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, I work with uh, Dina Goldman, who is a fantastic uh, production designer. We worked uh, with uh, Robert Hartman before, and I'm really impressed by that. And we work, you know, uh, on the, we used, you know, the, the different films, and you know, mainly we have been really inspired, as I mentioned it, you know, by uh, Let There Be Light. And, uh, the different sets in the John Huston documentary, and we use, you know, because I'm not able to film, to shoot in studio. I'm not, I'm not the studio guy. I was still trapped into the studio, so I prefer to, to shoot on locations. And we found this wonderful uh, psychiatric hospital, which was empty, and so that we could reinvent our own world, you know. So using bits and pieces of reality and adding, you know, these drawings that you were mentioning, you know, what uh, the drawn drawn by the, the materials, etc. And so it was a mixture of, you know, inventing a new world and uh, being put to reality because we were in a rural hospital for all these scenes. And I, I really love the, the result of it, yeah. If you did any research or whether you know what happened to Jimmy P after he was released from the hospital and whether he actually read the book and what did he think about the book? Uh, the book written by the, uh, by the doctor, um, by the psychiatrist. Do you read, do you read, did the director read the Deborah book? 
Now, what a genius piece ever read the book written about is Okay. Yes, you know. the other book. Yeah. So we don't know what happened to GMP. We don't. We tried. We worked a lot. We we, we have been found that we found the, the reservation where Jimmy where Jimmy grew up. We have been able to shoot on the reservation in Browning, and so we, because there are small details in the book which do not lie, you know, which permitted us to to, to find you know, the the your tribe. But all the identity of Jimmy is tied in the book, just like the old Tibetan identity of the book. You see what I mean? When we are speaking about Anna O, you know, uh, treated by Freud, we don't know exactly who she was. Actually, now we know who she was, you know. But Jimmy P is a very anonymous figure of us, you know, because the identity was clear, seen uh, by, uh, by Gabriel. And uh, so, but I know a few things of the, 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 the end of his life. Just because it's mentioned in the book, you know, actually, Jimmy had a very tough life. He was a native. So after the, the hospital, yeah, sure, he had children. But part of that, he recognized his daughter, he paid some, some good money, you know, for her. As you know, the, just like in the small scene, uh, uh, it's really heartbreaking. In the small scene, uh, where Jimmy is uh, in bed with uh, this young girl, you know, in Topeka, he said, perhaps I would go to see it. He never did go back to the reservation, but he rather go to work on cheap dance in, the, uh, in Seattle. And so it reminds me of a poem by uh, uh, Sherman Alexi, you know, the native poet, that, uh, the wonderful native poet that you have, you know. And I remember a bit small track of one of his poems. It's uh, two Indians, an old one and a young guy, waiting for the greyhound. And the old one is asking to the young one, where are you coming from? And the young one is saying, this is spring, I'm coming from the Atlantic where, because I've been to the Atlantic to be in the Atlantic. And I think I could head you know, to the Pacific to be in the Pacific. I guess that's what it is to be an American for a native. I guess that's what Jimmy, the, the kind of life that Jimmy had walking from one ocean to the other ocean, just by and having an empty life, you know, and still dealing with this like them and that kind of thing. A tough life, but a real one, a full one, fulfilled one. So it's a paradox that I try to express, but it's very hard scene with the genial colors. Yeah. Thank you so much, thank you for the film.